All right, how are you? Good. You sure? I'll ask you again. You can say it like you mean it if you really are. If not, don't play, okay? How you doing? You good? All right. All right. I'm glad to be with you. Love having our students lead, as Thomas mentioned. I don't know about you, but they shouldn't be backups, okay, man? They should be with us every week if they can. I just love their leadership and their love for Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. I do. And, and it's so fitting as we talk about parenting and you see what God's doing in the lives of young people and, and so much of that. Um, I just want to encourage the parents who are responsible for that. So grateful for you. Uh, I want to do a little participation here, so get ready, whatever that takes for you to participate in church, okay? Give yourself a little pep talk. Um, I want to ask you to raise your hand if um, you are a parent. Don't, don't do it yet. Wait till I'm done. If you are a parent or you know someone who is a parent or you've ever had a parent, okay? Get that hand up. Here we go. Just for a second. Now I want you to leave that up for just a moment, okay? Keep it up. Now I want you to keep your hand raised if you know that parenting can be difficult. Keep that up. All right? All right. Good. We're all in agreement. So let's get going. I love what Mark Twain said about parenting teenagers. He said, when they are 13, put them in a barrel and nail the lid shut. And then feed them through the knot hole. That was his advice. And then he said, when they are 16, plug the hole. Okay? <laughs> That's Mark Twain. Okay? He's a little street cred. I don't know if he had kids. But now, seriously, I love being a dad and have had so much joy from parenting. But I also know there's a lot of pain when we don't do things right. And I know there's a lot of pain when our kids walk in directions that we do not lead them in. You know, when Beth and I were married, we were like a lot of you, and that we had perfectly planned the first five years of our marriage, which meant two things. One, we were not going to have kids for five years. And two, we were going to travel the world on a youth pastor's salary, all right, which is like, get you to Eastern Des Moines, okay? It's about as far as our hotel change lasts us. And so that was our dream. And so you can imagine that we were surprised when Six months into marriage, we discovered that Beth was expecting, and we started having kids really young. In fact, we had a lot of kids so young that early on in our lives, people would ask us, are they really all yours, <laughs> okay? I was in a grocery store, and no joke, the cashier, I was with four of my kids, the cashier said, are they really all yours? I said, they're, they're all my, these are all my kids, and she said, are you Mormon? And I said, no, I just really like my wife, okay? <laughs> That's a different message, okay? And uh, if there's one piece of scripture we take seriously, it's where God said, uh, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, all right? So we're doing our best when it comes to that. And, and we love kids and we love our family. And we enjoy the journey of parenting. And we recognize that our kids, each of them, we have five, are incredible gifts from God. And I don't know about you, but when I receive a special gift, I want to handle that gift with both gratitude and care in response to the one who gave it to me. And that's what we're going to look at today. Parents, how do we care for and lead our children in a way that reflects God's dream for us and unleashes God's dream in the lives of our children and grandparents? If you've already raised your kids and your kids are out of the house, as they raise theirs, I think there's going to be a lot of good stuff for you here, okay? How do we do it? Well, I want to begin our time with a foundational principle called the parent's priority, and it's not original with me, but I love it, so I took it, and I want to read it for you and then build on it today. The parent's priority says that our priority is to gradually transfer a child's dependence away from the parent's until their dependence solely rests on God. Our role as parents, our priority is to transfer to parents' dependence away from us onto the only one who will never fail them, who will never leave them. Let me explain that. When our children are little, they depend on us for everything, don't they? In fact, if you're anything like me, there are days as a young parent, and especially days in the past, where I wake up feeling like I'm caught in a scene from the movie Groundhog Day. 
okay? And every day is filled with the same routine. You just feed them and change them and get them to bed and celebrate like, yes, we did it one more time. And you feed them and change them and get them to bed and high five your spouse. And you feed them and change them and get them to bed. And every time you go to bed and wake up and the alarm clock goes off, you think it's going to be different, but it's not. It's just the same routine over and over and over again. And some of you young parents, you're in the red zone of parenting, and this is where you're at. And you're like, man, does it ever change? And on one hand, I would say, man, embrace that season. It's a beautiful season. In spite of sometimes its monotony, it's majestic, and God's given it to you to embrace and to experience with great joy. However, there will come a day, I pray, when you begin to hand off dependence from yourself onto God and you teach them to lean into Him. That's your greatest priority as a parent. Now you say, where does that come from? In the book of the Bible called Deuteronomy, chapter 6, we receive what is really some of the greatest parenting advice as ones who are leading young people. Let me set it up for you. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses has just given the Ten Commandments to the Hebrew people, and then he's going to elaborate on those in the following chapters, but he begins chapter 6 with several principles that apply to us as parents. I don't have time to get into them all, but for the sake of today, I want to give you what I believe is the first and greatest priority we can put to work in our lives that will transform the way we approach our children and the responsibility of leading them. I'll read with you chapter 6, verse 1. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, Moses speaking. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy, and you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as you live, as long as you live. If you obey all of his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Now, I'm going to keep going in a moment, but I want to stop there. And I want you to catch that Moses is saying that as you teach your children, you will not only affect them, but you will affect their children's children, and not only their lives will be changed, but future generations to come will be changed. Parents, the power and responsibility you have been given as parents to shape the future and generations to come is remarkable. And Moses says, don't miss that. You say, well, how do we do that? Keep going. Verse 4, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And here's the principle. Number one, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. You want the greatest principle as parents for how to lead your kids away from dependence on you, dependence on your Father, Heavenly Father. Number one. You must, he says, love the Lord your God with how much of your heart? How much? Oh, okay, say it like you mean it. Love the Lord your God with how much of your heart? Good. He doesn't say with a percentage of your heart. He doesn't say with part of your heart. He says, I want you to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Now, if you're like me, this poses one of the greatest challenges for me as a father. Because we live in a world that is surrounding us with things that distract us from loving God with all of our heart. Isn't that true? For example, many of us want to provide for our kids, and that's good. But so many of us think to ourselves, you know, the very best gift I could give to my kids is to give them more than what my parents gave to me. That's how some of us think. And so we work long jobs, long hours. We pour ourselves into our careers so we can give them more things, but we don't take the time to point them to the giver of every good thing, who is our Heavenly Father. Many of us want to provide our kids with the best opportunities. And listen, I'm for that. Provide them with great opportunities. But we get them into soccer and ballet and gymnastics and choir, and before long, We heap upon them so much responsibility and commitment that we have no margin left by which to pursue God. 
Some of us are running after so many resources so that we can have nicer things to give our kids, so you can have a nicer, safer car, so you can get leather seats to put their little booties in, and you can transport them kind of all around where you need to take them, and you give them great gifts, but you never talk to them about the greatest gift. Some of us, our kids are nearing 16. Listen, I've got an almost 17-year-old and almost 15-year-old, so we got two cars sitting in the driveway, and they are not pretty cars, all right? But there's an enormous amount of pressure as parents to get our kids into a car. And in our culture, it would be almost child abuse to not give our kids a car when they turn 16. So you're surrounded by messages that say, if you want to lead your kids well, give them better things. Give them a better education. And before long, we become focused on our kids, not on the Father who gave us our kids in the first place. And listen, don't hear me wrong, I'm all for a great education. I want my kids to have the greatest education they can have. I'm all for great opportunities. I want to give my kids opportunities. I'm all for providing for them. For heaven's sakes, I spend a majority of my income to feed them day in and day out, okay? I want to provide for them. But I also know there's a better gift that I can give to them. And this is so real for so many of us. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with parents who pull me to the side. I see them out in the community and they say, Jed, man, we just want to get back to church. We've just been so busy and we've had games and house projects and trips that we're taking. And it's been a long time since we've been around, but we're going to get back. We're just so, we're going to get back. We want to get back. And when I hear these conversations, and, and maybe that's part of your story, my heart breaks because I see that the pattern that we set for our kids shapes so much about their affections and their commitments too. Now don't hear me wrong, I'm not suggesting that from time to time you and I are not going to miss a Sunday. I'm not suggesting that. And I'm not at all pretending that you and I can't follow Jesus on the soccer field, sidelines, while cheering our kids on as they chase a little white ball around the field. I'm not pretending that. Okay, you can. You can follow Jesus there. What I am suggesting is that as parents, we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that the priorities we model for our kids don't matter and ultimately don't help establish their own priorities. For example, do you know how important it is, parents, that you be actively involved in a local church. You know how important that is? And by active involvement, I don't mean that we arrive late and sit in the back and get out at offering time to go to Qdoba so we can beat everybody else to the tacos, okay? That's not what I'm saying. By active involvement, I mean that we embrace the local church we're a part of, we commit to its mission, we get invested according to how God has given us passion and personality and and giftedness, and we invest ourselves there for the good of the body and for the glory of Jesus so that the mission of helping people find their way back to God can continue to become true. You know how important that is, parents, that you do that? I recently came across a study that talks about the effects of parents who are actively involved in a local church and the effects of parents who choose not to be. The study said that if mom and dad went to church actively, and not just attend church, but are actively involved in a local church, then 72% of their kids will attend and be actively involved as well. 72%. Now, if mom only went to church, look at this, that percentage drops to 15%. Dads, how important is your role in actively pursuing Jesus through the expression of the local church? Dads, how important is your role? Get this. Studies say that if only dad attends church, 55% of their kids will attend church and be actively committed to Jesus. Get this. If neither mom or dad are actively involved in the local church, and I don't mean actively involved by like we show up on Easter and Christmas. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you call this your own, you invest in it according to how God has wired you. If neither mom or dad are invested, only 6% of their kids will grow up to do the same. Do you believe that? 
How important is your role as a young man, a young woman, for the young men and young women that God has placed in your home? It is vitally important. God believes it. He calls us to do it. Statistics show us and challenge us, and yet I am challenged by it because I know even in my own life, there are things in my lives that threaten my love for Jesus. And listen, this goes way beyond church attendance. It goes into the things we do and the words we say. For example, if I were to show up in your home unannounced, what would what I find tell you or tell me about your love for the Lord? Now, listen, first confession. You show up in my house unannounced, number one, my dog's going to bark at you, okay? And number two, I have no idea what you're going to find, all right? And there are some days you walk in and say, man, this cat has a long way to go, all right? Because I do. And yet I want to play this out for a little while. If I were to walk into your house unannounced, let me ask you, what would the television shows that you watch talk about your heart? What would they say about your active commitment to Jesus and the things he cares about? Let me ask you, if I were to open up your home computer, dads, look at your browsing history for the last month. What would it say about your active pursuit of Jesus and commitment to his heart and character? Let me ask you if I were to walk in and I were to see how you allocate your resources. What would that say about the priority structure of your heart? You know, we're going to talk about that next week. What would it say about the things you value most? Not what you want to value most, but what you actually value most and what that's modeling for your children. If I were to look at the things you read or the music you listen to, and listen, I'm all for all kinds of music. We're incredibly eclectic in the Mullinex home. I'm all for diversity. I'm not suggesting you listen to the fish all the time, okay? But what I am saying is, what about the messages that are running through your home? What do they say about your affection for Jesus? Not what you hope they say, but what they actually communicate. You see, as parents, the best thing we can do for our children is to love God with all of our hearts and to let that play out in every area of our lives. Now, if you're like me, listen, and some of us are like, oh, man, i got a long way to go. And listen, my heart is not to discourage you, but to encourage you. If you are like me and there are some days you wake up discouraged, let's get a little honest poll here. Any parents ever feel discouraged in this journey? Okay. Any parents ever feel like you have a long way to go? Any parents ever feel like me, God, what in the world were you thinking to give me kids? You ever have that thought? Okay. Who am I? There are days I feel ill-equipped. I have no idea what I'm doing. I feel like sometimes Beth and I are going to have to allocate more resources to counseling than to college so the counselor can figure out everything we busted up, okay? I just, I think that at times. And I can get discouraged by that. And there were years early on in raising our little ones that were just at times overwhelming. And I remember one time I picked up the phone and I called my friend who's in his 70s and He's raised five kids, and they're out, and they have their own families. And I said to him, Dave, what do I do? I just kind of emotionally vomited. You ever done that? And I said, man, I'm a terrible father. I have no idea what I'm doing. Somebody's going to have to fix what we've broken. It was just one of those days. And Dave graciously listened, and then he gave me the best piece of parenting advice I've ever received. And it's transformed the way I've led my kids for the last 10 years. And I'm going to give it to you. Ten years ago, I received this, and so I would encourage you to write it down because I think it will transform the way you lead your young ones. They've said to me, Jed, your kids don't need perfect parents. They need real parents. He said, Jed, your kids don't need a perfect dad. They need a real dad. And with those words this 500-pound gorilla I'd been carrying around was taken off of my shoulder. I would communicate the same to you. Moms, dads, your young daughters, young sons don't need a perfect mom and dad. They need a real mom. And yet we live in a culture that is constantly pressuring us to be perfect parents. Wouldn't you agree? Beth was just recently at a museum and 
she was coming to the end of the day and she heard this chaos on the other side of the room. And so she looked over and she saw this scene. It, it's an incredible illustration of what I'm talking about. There's a mom who beneath her on the floor is an, a child, a toddler, absolutely losing it. Just complete temper tantrum. Okay, I am a pastor. I have no idea what that would be like, but I assume that that was a bad day for that mom. And then next to the toddler, you've been there, there's another young child antagonizing the toddler who's having a difficult time. And then the third child is seated next to mom on a bench, quietly, while mom is on her phone. And all of this is happening around her. What is mom doing on the phone? I have no idea. Probably Googling, what do I do when my child throws a fit in a museum, okay? And... And this is the best part. Beth looks over and she says, you, you won't believe this. You won't believe this. As all this is happening, mom's wearing a shirt. And on the shirt is one word. And the shirt just says, happy. I love that. I'm happy. My world's a mess, but I'm happy, okay? Wheels absolutely coming off the train, but I'm happy. And I just wonder how great of a picture that is for the pressure many of us feel as parents. Isn't that true? I'm confused, but I'm happy. I've got to play that. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm happy. I'm discouraged, right? But I'm happy. I'm disappointed by the ways some of my kids are traveling, but I'm, I'm happy. I'm on the wrong path as a parent. I know it, but I'm happy because... I've got to pose it and play it so no one knows how unhappy or discouraged I actually am or how exhausting this journey of leading young ones can actually be. And before we know it, we slip into the very game of trying to be perfect parents when in fact what our kids actually need is real parents. You say, well, what do you mean by a real parent? Let me give you several examples. I think first and foremost, what it means parents is that we first settle in our hearts that the greatest gift we can give to our kids is not opportunity, not money, not inheritance, not education even, but ourselves and our active love for Jesus with everything that we are. You want to be a real parent? You settle that in your heart. The greatest thing we can do for our kids is to love Jesus with everything that we are. And then when you do that, because when you sit underneath the unconditional love of Jesus who will never fail you and never leave you, and we already celebrated, who gave his life to give you life, when you sit in the confidence of that love, you know what will happen, parents? You can begin to confess honestly that you're not perfect. And some of you, the burden you're carrying around to try to be something that you're not is unbearable. But when you confess and can honestly share, I am not perfect. But by the grace of God, I want to love Jesus with all that I am. God will begin to do a new work in your life. What's it mean to be real? Dads, listen to me for a moment. You know what I think it means to be real for some of us is that we start to confess things like anger and irritability. Beth, sometimes, or the Holy Spirit, sometimes they're interchangeable, how God works in my life, will tell me, Jake, you got to take care of this controlling tone you have with your kids. You've got to be more gracious to them. And I need to confess that so God can work through that. Men, this applies to women too, but I'll just talk to guys for a second. Men, some of us need to confess addiction. And we need to get real about lust in our lives. And we need to stop making excuses for the patterns of behavior that our father had that we continue to carry out. And instead, acknowledge those so that through our realness, God can change us. You know what it means to be real, parents? It means that you and I begin to confess that at times we allow the culture to establish our priorities rather than allowing Jesus to set the pace for our lives. And I'll tell you, when we do a message series around parenting, I'll share more on this, but Beth and I have found that if Jesus is going to be king of our family, that there are times that our family will look different than many of the families around us. 
And I don't mean by how we dress, okay? I mean by our pace and our schedule and our commitments. Because I realize I have to create margin relentlessly in our family and for our kids by which they can pursue Jesus with their hearts and by which we can love one another. And family, some of you don't have any margin by which to do that. And I would encourage you to confess that. And bring people around you to encourage you in that. You know what it means to be real? For many of us parents, it means to stop walking the journey on our own. And to bring other parents into our lives who can say, just like you, I'm imperfect, but we're running after a perfect God who will never leave us or forsake us. And even when we feel like the train is coming off the tracks, our God is faithful. And he who gave us kids in the first place is faithful to lead us, to lead those and to love those children for their good and for his glory. And I just wonder today what God could begin to do in many of your lives if you begin to let go of playing perfect and instead begin to become real, and then to bring your family under the kingship of Jesus and allow him to restore perhaps what's been broken or maybe simply to restore your lives around his dream. One more thing, and finally, you want to be real? then I would encourage you to come to your Heavenly Father today and ask Him for help. Best piece of advice I can give you outside of being real and not perfect is to regularly acknowledge that you have a Heavenly Father who wants to help. Listen to Jesus' words out of Matthew chapter 7. He said, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Parents, sometimes the help we need is just on the other side of asking our heavenly Father for help. So go to him and lean into him and learn to trust him and actively love him. And model that pursuit for your kids. And if you do, imagine with me how that would not only shape the lives of your young ones or your grown-up ones, but Moses says it will actually shape their kids' lives and their kids' kids' lives for future generations. And I believe you can do it. And that's my heart for you. And so I want to give you three questions, as Matt said, that we're going to give you to reflect on in the days ahead by which to put this into action. And I'll say, if you're a grandparent in here, and I know we have some, let this be an encouragement to you for how you translate this into your kids' lives as they lead their kids' lives. You've got a great responsibility. Okay? Three questions. Number one, ask this. Don't ask it alone. Bring another friend into your life. Ask it with your spouse. Ask the question, what do my priorities say about my love for God? What do they say? What do my priorities say about my love for God? Beth and I have to ask that question often because imagine with me if we want to go east with our kids and arrive in New York City, but we're going west with our priorities, we can't go west faster, smarter, or harder and ever get east. Some of us are traveling in the wrong direction, and the only way you'll course correct and begin moving toward the Lord is if you ask the question, do my priorities really convey that I love Jesus with everything that I am and where not? And how many of us could say that with all that we are, our priorities do? No, every one of us being real, we've got a long ways to go. Where our priorities don't reflect an active pursuit of Jesus, we allow him to shape us, right? For our good, for the good of our kids. Number two, number two, am I leading my children by example, to depend on God. Parents, one of the greatest gifts you can give your kids is a visible, active pursuit of Jesus. For them to see you pouring your heart into God's Word, 
for them to hear you modeling simple conversation, we call it prayer, with the Father. For them to see you shaping your life around Jesus' kingship and his leadership. That's impactful for any of us, and it will change the lives of your kids. Number three, finally, don't, don't miss this one. Who am I inviting into my parenting journey? Don't do it alone. Some of the greatest gifts and seasons of growth Beth and I have experienced have been when we've had friends and family around us to encourage us to keep going. And we are for you, and if there's any way that we can encourage you, we want you to let us know. But as we close today, I just want to pray for you. As you begin to reflect on those questions, would you bow your heads with me? Father, we love you. And we are grateful for your presence in our lives. We thank you for Jesus' words that say, you are a good heavenly father and we only have to come to you and ask for help. And you'll give us good gifts. So in this moment, all of us collectively, as we have conversation with you right now, we say, Jesus, that at the core of who we are, we want to be real. We don't want to play it or pretend we're something we're not. But Jesus, we want to run after your dream for our lives and for the the lives of our kids like never before. I know in a place like this, there's got to be some honesty with you. And if that's true of you, just be honest with Jesus right now. There's got to be some confession of realities in our homes that reflect something other than an active pursuit of you. I know for many of us like me, there's got to be a reassessment of my priorities and what they say about my affection for you. I need some. I know some parents today simply need encouragement to keep going. Some of us who are tired need rest. Some of us discouraged need motivation. Would you inspire them by your spirit? Some of us who are alone need friendship. Would you provide that, Lord, because you are a good Heavenly Father. And as you do, we want to lead our kids to embrace your dream for their lives, to depend on you with all that they need. And we pray these things in the great name of Jesus. Together we pray, amen, amen. You know what? We love you. I hope to see you next.